viewers on behalf of global hospitals for in mumbai my my sir maybe you can yeah. say that okay. a very good afternoon to all the viewers on behalf of global hospitals for in mumbai myself dr pushkar mehta would like to welcome you all uh, in another facebook live session today and two special doctors with us here today dr pankaj agarwal as well as dr narin nayak to discuss an interesting topic and that is no more about parkinson's disease as we set out uh, on this uh, short session to understand more about parkinson's disease i think uh, it's it's uh, very vital to understand the background and what the disease is itself so my first question is uh, to dr pankaj agarwal and that is what is parkinson's disease yes so thank you very much uh, pushkar for uh, arranging this uh, very important uh, facebook live and uh, with my colleague dr narin nayak and uh, both of us have great interest in parkinson's disease i think we will be able to answer some interesting questions so um, you asked what is parkinson's disease so parkinson's is a brain disorder and it is caused by degeneration of cells in the brain and this disease causes uh, shaking and slowness and stiffness so it is a degenerative brain disease and it is actually very common more than 1% of people above the age of 60 have this disease so that is parkinson's or kampavath as it is known because of the tremor so so that is parkinson's disease okay uh, but what causes as you said it's a degenerative disease but what causes parkinson's right so very good question and there is great research to find out the exact cause of parkinson's what we do know is that uh, there are certain crucial areas in the in the substantia nigra one portion of the brain that are uh, degenerate and because of which the signals do not reach from the brain to the hands and legs thereby causing the cardinal or main symptoms of the disease such as slowness of the body or tremor of one hand or uh, stiffness and rigidity difficulty in walking so um, uh, so th so that that is uh, the cause in simple terms of parkinson's disease okay with this uh, information obviously uh, the next question that comes to mind is that what are the symptoms of parkinson's when i uh, experience those symptoms that's the right time to visit a doctor so what are the symptoms of parkinson's yes and i think it bears some repeating the symptoms of parkinson's as we commonly say are uh, slowness stiffness and shaking so i like to say the three s's slowness stiffness and shaking so the body becomes slow and often patients will tell us that they take longer to wear their shirt or for example to to brush their teeth or to shave every activity becomes slow their gait may become slow they may walk much more slowly they may speak slowly so slowness of daily activities is number 1 number 2 is stiffness of the whole body they have aches and pains in the in the commonly in one shoulder or on one side or anywhere really in the lower back the whole body becomes stiff so stiffness is another uh, and uh, shaking this is of course one of the main symptoms of parkinson's or tremor or shaking of one hand typically of course over years it can spread to the other hand other areas where tremor can be there is uh, of the leg sometimes of the jaw they may get uh, symptoms like that so whenever somebody has any of these symptoms especially in combination slowness stiffness shaking poor balance while walking and they may tend to tip forward and they walk with very small steps you know so if and slow volume speech that's another common symptom so when all of these symptoms any of these symptoms are present you must visit a neurologist and uh, make sure you do not have parkinson's disease Uh, the symptoms that you just measured uh, seem to be uh, motor symptoms uh, any non motor symptoms of parkinson's disease that uh, you would like to tell us yeah excellent question pushkar because this is the parkinson's that you don't see it this is the non motor symptoms these are the non motor symptoms of parkinson's what i told you is motor relating to movement and everyone can see that if somebody has it but uh, patients with parkinson's often experience and these this parkinson's patients will tell you they may experience problems with their mood so they may be depressed because of the parkinson's causing changes in certain areas of the brain new transmitters of the brain then second is uh, they may have difficulty in thinking or cognition after several years of parkinson's so it may affect their uh, ability to handle day to day situations um, uh, cognitively then the other thing is they may have constipation because of uh, uh you know certain changes in the gastrointestinal tract then difficulty with smell they are not able to smell as well as other people 
Parkinson's patients. So that's another uh, important non-motor symptom. Another another symptom is sleep. So typically patients with Parkinson's have uh, they may kick about in sleep or thrash about their limbs or they may have uh, vivid dreams. So this is called REM behavior disorder and this is also not uncommon in Parkinson's disease. So all these symptoms, depression, constipation, difficulty with smell and uh, sometimes hallucinations, uh, sleep problems, pain, all these are the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah. Uh, when we go uh, through the information that is available to us in all the forums, we uh, understand that there is something that is known as advanced Parkinson's also. So would you like to enlighten us that what is advanced Parkinson's? What happens in, in that Parkinson's? Right. So what we said is maybe in the beginning part of Parkinson's, when really somebody want, has early symptoms, what we have spoken so far is about early symptoms of how to recognize Parkinson's. But after somebody has established Parkinson's disease, you know that this disease is lifelong and they have to live with this disease forever and we cannot remove this disease from the brain. So once Parkinson's is established and patients are put on medication, they are diagnosed, then after that over several years begins the middle stages or the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. So after three to five years, for example, uh, you can say that uh, the, the middle phase has begun and then after maybe eight or ten years or even longer, you know, is uh, uh, is when you can say that the advanced stages of this disease have begun and they come with their own challenges, which are different from the challenges in the initial part of the disease. So we'll speak about okay. that as we go on. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, depending upon the disease onset and uh, how many years a patient has been suffering from Parkinson's, so how do we uh, treat in different uh, stages? Uh, as well as in different time frames uh, for Parkinson's disease. Yes, and this is very important. And it is, uh, first of all, important to recognize that now there are specialist doctors, uh, including myself, of course, a movement disorder specialist uh, for this disease. And, uh, you know, in the early stages, the emphasis is on uh, uh, getting some control over the shaking or the slowness and stiffness um, in the first few years. And then patients often are extremely better immediately. So it's like a honeymoon we say that for the first few years they are very good after you start treatment but after a few years the disease progresses and the medicines don't work as effectively for example earlier the syndopa plus or levodopa that we give them they that may produce benefit for five hours or six hours as the disease progresses after a few years that medicine only acts for two or three hours and then there is increasing but then one has to give the medicines more frequently for example so, so as as the time as time progresses, the symptoms become more difficult to manage, and they do not respond as well or robustly as they did in the initial four or five years of the disease. So, so in that stage, in that stage, we have some techniques or strategies. For example, uh, using more frequent dosing, giving dopamine agonists, or giving medicines to prolong the effect of levodopa, such as COMT inhibitors. Um, and um, with these strategies, we can pull on for several years and uh, continue to keep our patients uh, well. In the more advanced stages, this becomes even more difficult. And at that stage, then we will need, and sometimes patients, very often actually, patients will get dancing movements or dyskinesia and they're moving all about. And, uh, you know, if we reduce, if we, if we reduce the medications, then the dyskinesia or dancing may, may get better, but then the off period increases. So therefore we are stuck between dyskinesia on one hand and severe off periods on the other hand. So when these motor fluctuations become unmanageable, that is the stage when we will consider surgical treatment or deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. So, so these are the various uh, sort of uh, ways in which we will handle Parkinson's disease as the years go. Okay, and that uh, you've just touched upon a very important topic and that is related to Parkinson's and that sets uh, the session where I uh, would like to ask Dr. Narin Nayak that uh, what is deep brain stimulation uh, and also could you elaborate uh, again on what are the candidates who are ideal candidates for deep brain stimulation? Oh, thank you, Bushkar, for inviting me for this uh, Facebook live session. So to explain in simple terms, deep brain stimulation surgery is a highly sophisticated procedure where we mix two small openings in the skull and we insert very fine 
electrodes in a specific area of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. So this area is the area where we have the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And once we insert this electrode in this area, these electrodes are connected by means of a wire and they are attached to the pacemaker. All the entire setup is internal, so nothing is visible from the outside. And by means of the pacemaker, this helps in uh, ameliorating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease like uh, rigidity, bradykinesia and tremor. So this procedure is unique compared to other neurosurgical procedures in that it is performed mainly under local anesthesia. The major part of this surgery occurs in the local anesthesia. So unlike other neurosurgical procedures where the patient is under general anesthesia and we only know at the end of the procedure what is the outcome, here the patient is an active participant. So he's aware of the procedure, he's participating with us. So there is live on table testing of the electrode. So when we give the stimulation by means of the electrode, the patient will experience the benefit that he experiences while he takes the medicine. So there will be reduction in the tremor, there will be reduction in the rigidity, and there will be reduction in the bradykinesia. So on table, we can test for the benefit of this surgery. At the same time, we have the benefit of watching out if there is a possibility of side effects. So if we are in, not in the right area, suppose we are somewhere close to a motor tract and there is stimulation, then the patient will experience some side effects. So immediately we can know that uh, during the procedure, what is the right channel to be used. So unlike other procedures where you do not know till the end of the procedure, here on table you can demonstrate the benefit and take care so that there are no side effects. And the main thing is the entire surgery is performed under local anesthesia. And after the end of the procedure, we make sure by means of computerized setup to make sure that we are in the correct position. So this is a high degree of accuracy and very low chance of having error. So the second question that you asked me was which are, who are the patients who are candidates for deep brain stimulation surgery. So as Pankaj has already touched upon it, so the initial phase of the illness, the medical line of management is the main uh, force. So the patient will experience benefits due to the medicines. But as the disease progresses, after a few years, they will start noticing that the effect of medication is reducing. They require larger doses of medication and the benefit from each dose starts reducing in duration from initial few hours, five to eight hours to comes down to every two to three hours. When the effect of medication is draining off and the patient start experiencing the side effects, that is the dancing moments or the dyskinesia, these are the patients who would be the ideal candidates who could consider deep brain stimulation. A deep brain stimulation has the advantage in that the patient will experience all the benefits that he was experiencing with the medical treatment. But however, unlike the medical treatment where after some years where there is fluctuation in the response, in deep brain stimulation surgery, you'll have a uniform electrical stimulation 24-7, 365. So you'll have continuous stimulation. So you will not experience the fluctuations of the off and on periods. At the same time, Deep brain stimulation is very useful for patients who are experiencing dancing movements or dyskinesia because once deep brain stimulation is done, the requirement of medication, the total dose of medication reduces, the number of medications can be stopped and a few of them, few of the medications of course will continue lifelong but the dosage requires goes down significantly and once the dose of medication goes down, the side effects which arise from taking large dose of medication also automatically reduce. And so there is excellent benefit uh, in symptoms of this kind of Okay. Uh, having understood, uh, and thank you for a very uh, detailed explanation, uh, uh, Dr. Narinayak, because it gives all our viewers as well as myself a clear idea as to how the surgery is done. Uh, as you have uh, rightly mentioned that the surgery is done under local anesthesia. In your experience, uh, the safety of the surgery as well as the outcome of the surgery, what would you like to comment on both these aspects? So I think this is one of the safest surgeries in neurosurgery because the patient we operate under local anesthesia. The second we use an algorithm and computer models to plan the surgery. So the entire surgery is controlled right from the time we take the skin incision to the time of skin closure. So the trajectory, the path we are going to take, the areas of the brain that we are going to traverse, all this is planned beforehand. So we know exactly which area of the brain we are going to go, the path we are going to take. Is there any vessel or is there any other important structure we might harm? So all that is all planned before surgery. You are in full control of the surgery. 
So I think this is one of the safest uh, procedures that we can consider in neurosurgery. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Agarwal mentioned, uh, you know, about motor as well as non-motor symptoms uh, in the earlier part of the session. So uh, through DBS, uh, which symptoms are best treated or all of them are treated? Uh, what would you like to comment on this? So mainly the focus in the primary motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease like slowness, that is bradykinesia. So it improves bradykinesia, then the shaking moments or the tremor that we have that uh, responds excellently to deep brain stimulation. In many patients of Parkinson's disease, this symptom may not respond to medical treatment, but it uh, responds to deep brain stimulation. And then of course, rigidity. These are the main three uh, cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which responds to deep brain stimulation. And also, as I already mentioned, it reduces the uh, dyskinesia or the excessive movements that some patients experience in long-term care. And once the deep brain stimulation, we have noticed that patients, other symptoms also will partly, patient will have more energy and other aches and body pains, all that uh, other symptoms also reduce significantly. And uh, some patients notice slight improvement in the non motor symptoms of the disease after undergoing deep brain stimulation. But the main focus is on treating the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease, that is rigidity, bradykinesia and uh, tremors. Okay. Uh, what are what are the types of pacemakers uh, that are used in this surgery? So the pacemaker now we have two options. We have the non-rechargeable variant and the rechargeable variant. So the non-rechargeable variant is uh, the advantage is once it is inserted, then you don't have to worry about it. It keeps on functioning 24/7. But uh, and it is good for older patients, usually people above the age of 70, and people who do not have help or social support at home and out or in are in care uh, and do not have backup. So such patients, it's very good because once you put the pacemaker, you don't have to you know worry about maintaining anything, and it will keep on working. But the thing is, it has a definite lifespan. So around four to five years is what we expect the pacemaker to function. And uh, after that, the patient has to undergo another surgery for replacing the pacemaker, where only the pacemaker is replaced. The remaining part of the surgery remains the same. Nobody will uh, bring about any changes in the electrodes, but the pacemaker battery has to be changed. We will require another surgery. So this is ideal for older patients and uh, in special social uh, circumstances, this may be useful. The uh, second option that we have is the rechargeable variant. The rechargeable is uh, it's like pretty much like charging your mobile. You have to charge it once in seven to ten days. So once you charge it, then uh, it'll keep on functioning for a week to ten days. But you have to charge it uh, every seven to ten days. So that is the thing. But uh, the advantage of that is uh, it will last for around uh, fourteen to fifteen years. So three times of the non-rechargeable variant. So we recommend these uh, rechargeable uh, IPGs for patients who are in the younger age group, like around 60, maybe less than that. Some young onset Parkinson's disease patients are there. Such patients definitely should consider the rechargeable uh, uh, IPG. Okay. Uh, the battery life as well as changing the batteries in case of uh, uh, rechargeable uh, variants, uh, your experience and comments on the so rechargeable, uh, it's got a long duration like so you have about 15 years and only after 15 years you require a replacement. So mostly we don't, uh, such patients, uh, whatever the replacements we do are for the non-rechargeable variants only. So we hardly have any patients with, the, you know, the rechargeable variant undergoing change. So it depends on the age you're choosing. If you're older patients are around 70, uh, you could choose a non-rechargeable variant and uh, you know the patient can have a very fruitful life depending on how much uh, charge is being drawn from the battery you can extend the life for about five years okay pushkar uh, if i can make a comment yeah yeah sure please go ahead so i think uh, that was an excellent uh, sort of uh, discussion or uh, uh, information you know provided by dr nayar and of course on the procedure of uh, DBS and uh, how the insert, uh, electrodes are inserted and the pacemaker, how it works. And we must understand that uh, this is a, this, as Dr. Nayak has mentioned, it is a highly sophisticated surgery, but also that it is not anything that is new. Deep brain stimulation has been around for more than three decades in the world and more than two decades at least in India as well. And this is a highly sort of uh, uh, you know specialized uh, treatment and it is also easily available 
in major cities in India and of course including Mumbai at our center and it has been performed with great success very regularly. So uh, I think some of the questions that we have is whether this is a new therapy or if it is experimental etc. That is certainly not the case because this is proven by science and in fact the field of DBS has moved very very far ahead and uh, there are new devices and new technology which are uh, becoming increasingly available and new pacemakers uh, which are becoming increasingly used uh, by uh, neurologists and uh, movement disorder specialists to to more to even more effectively and simply enable patients and their caregivers to live with parkinsons even in the advanced stages and uh, so many of our patients have benefited tremendously in their advanced pd and this we see on a very regular basis where uh, whereby they may be disabled they may not be able to perform their even their daily activities at home and in a very poor shape motorically as well as non motor wise and so really it is um, a, one of the things that is commonly said about dps is that it is a life changing therapy and uh, this is indeed very true and uh, as the years go on and we use this therapy more and more this great uh, this great benefit of uh, therapy when applied to carefully selected patients when applied in a very careful and controlled manner uh, when we do all these right things we can really improve the lives of parkinson's patients tremendously so so i think uh, one more thing i want to say is that um, we are in april of course today is april 22 and uh, april is parkinson's uh, month or is celebrated as parkinson's awareness month worldwide so april 11th was parkinson's world parkinson's day and uh, so commonly around the world various activities are organized uh, for increasing awareness in parkinson's uh, you, you know support groups and uh, so i think it is very appropriate that we are uh, discussing parkinson's disease its symptoms uh, its treatment medical treatment and surgical treatment uh, you know, today and in the month of April. So I just wanted to point that out as well. I think uh, that is the entire uh, motive of doing such sessions where we create awareness and spread the right information uh, uh, to people. And uh, in, just in these comments, you have uh, kind of cleared a lot of doubts that people have regarding uh, the safety, the accuracy, as well as uh, the evidence related to deep brain stimulation. Uh, we would take uh, three more questions uh, along with uh, uh, a couple of viewer questions. Uh, one of the viewer questions for uh, Dr. Pankaj Agarwal is, uh, is DBS a curative treatment completely? And uh, your comments on the same. Yes, so DBS is not a cure for Parkinson's disease. We must understand this. But having said that, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease worldwide. Okay, and research is on to find out why Parkinson's disease happens and various types of Parkinson's, but there is no easy answer to that question. And that is, of course, a big overarching question in scientific research in neurology circles and Parkinson circles around the world. So, but while we wait for a cure, we can assure you that uh, DBS is uh, the strongest treatment currently for the motor symptoms of disabling Parkinson's, advanced Parkinson's disease. So while it is not a cure, it is certainly a very, very effective treatment for carefully selected patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay. Uh, uh, another viewer question for Dr. Narin Nayak. Uh, and the question is that, is resurgery required at any stage after uh, the first uh, DBS? And what are the conditions or instances where a resurgery, if required, uh, would be taken up? So as I have already mentioned, so this surgery is one of, uh, you know, a completely controlled procedures. So the entire surgery is planned beforehand and on table there is testing using electrophysiology. There is on table stimulation. We identify the channels and the area of the brain where the patient has the maximum benefit. So this surgery does not require resurgery for placement of the leads. The only situation where it will require resurgery, as I mentioned, is for changing your battery. Suppose you have chosen a non-rechargeable variant and after five years, the battery starts running out, then you will require a small procedure just to replace the battery. The rest okay. of the electrodes and all which have already been implanted, they don't require to be removed. They don't require to be repositioned and you don't require resurgery for that. 
and if you have chosen a you know rechargeable battery of course it's 15 year lifespan so you will not require any research i would like to make one point uh, one more point because we are discussing whether there is a cure for parkinson disease and how this thing um, surgery benefits the other thing that you should remember is that this is not like a one time you know you put the surgery you start the battery and everything is over because as the disease progresses the tremor may increase the rigidity may increase the bradykinesia may increase so you can modulate you can adjust the settings of this battery without doing it externally and you can increase uh, the supply that you can improve the electrical stimulation and if the tremor increases if the rigidity increases if the bradykinesia increases the current can be increased and you can again uh, take care of this problem so you can keep on modulating the output of this battery for a very long time and keep, it can keep pace with the progression of the illness so you can uh, virtually guarantee good control of these problems for a very long time using this procedure okay uh, uh another question to dr pankaj agarwal and that is uh, other diseases apart from parkinson's where a deep brain stimulation can be used yes so one of the important diseases is essential tremor and this is a look alike of parkinson's but is actually much more common than parkinson's and uh, it is one of the most common diseases in neurology actually and we see this commonly and in this disease patients get shaking of their hands bilaterally both hands and this goes on for many many decades it commonly runs in families now in essential tremor the target of the brain the nucleus in the brain where we insert the electrode is slightly different uh, it is in the vim thalamus and uh, but even there the the effect of uh, of the dbs on the essential tremor is excellent okay so so that is one common indication as well the other indication which is also common is dystonia so dystonia of course means uh, twisting of the body of the muscles and often dbs is done for the pediatric age group or more common in children of generalized dystonia so patients uh, who have the, uh, dystonic movements in their whole body twisting of their face or neck or their hands and legs and if it is not controlled by medication then dystonia is another disease where uh, deep brain stimulation can help tremendously okay uh, this almost brings us to the closure of uh, a very interesting uh, uh, session today uh, we would like to have closing comments uh, from both the consultants here with us today dr nare naik first your closing comments for the session so my uh, closing comment would be a deep brain stimulation surgery is a safe procedure it is an effective procedure the selection of the patient has to be perfect so if you are experiencing any of the problems of parkinson's disease which are not responding adequately to medical treatment or you are experiencing any side effect do not delay in seeking consultation with a movement disorder neurologist because you may be a very good candidate for deep brain stimulation we have had patients who have undergone deep brain stimulation surgery after delaying it for a very long time and regretting that they haven't hadn't undergone the procedure earlier in fact we have few of our patients telling that please doctor you recommend this patients to undergo the procedure early in the course of illness when it is just starting so that they can experience the benefit of this procedure for a very long time sure uh, dr pankaj agarwal your closing comments for the session yeah no i think that is an excellent point made by dr nayak and uh, we feel strongly about that as well so we are very careful in selecting patients for deep brain stimulation so we we must also emphasize that this is not for every patient with parkinson's disease but for patients who will really benefit a lot but for those patients where it, they will benefit it, they have to be they have to be uh, you know they have to be counseled appropriately and at the right time so so i think uh, one must uh, really have a, a low threshold to to visiting uh, you know a movement disorder specialist neurologist uh if they have parkinson's disease to know if they can benefit with this in addition to the point made about dbs i would just like to say that uh, parkinson's disease is still under recognized still under treated patients are not even aware of the existence of this common brain disorder and uh, we must uh, spread awareness by uh, by forums uh, such as these and talks such as these that uh, if you have slowness or stiffness or shaking of the body on one side or um, uh, or loss of balance or poor speech it could be parkinson's so meet your neurologist and uh, do not delay in seeking treatments if you already have parkinson's disease you must know that there are excellent treatments which can really improve your quality of life 
and even the symptoms which uh, which you may feel will not improve for example severe tremor severe dyskinesia so by adjustment of medications and by um, various other non pharmacological treatments as well sometimes quality of life can greatly be improved uh, uh, in patients with parkinson's disease so there is excellent treatment available we are fortunate that this is a treatable disorder and there are not only levodopa but there are many other good medications as well and so that even manipulation of those medicines appropriately may allow patients to have a tremendous benefit in their quality of life for several years even before they require dps so there is a lot we can do and there are specialized clinics available including in global hospital in ours movement disorder clinic where uh, where we uh, have great interest in parkinsons and uh, we can really help them improve their quality of life so i think um, that message i would like to reemphasize Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Pankaj Agarwal, as well as Dr. Narain Nayak, for a very informative and an interesting session today afternoon. Uh, we would like to thank all the viewers uh, for participating in this session. Uh, remember that this session will be uploaded to YouTube later, so you can share it with your friends and family and create awareness about Parkinson's as well as deep brain stimulation. Uh, this is Dr. Pushpar Mehta from Global Hospitals, Parel, Mumbai. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Pushpar.